Well, my wife Nanelle and I have a custom. Our custom is of getting up late, usually, on most Saturdays. Uh, and uh, if there's no deacons meeting, if there is no men's ministry breakfast, then she and I cook breakfast together, and we eat breakfast in the den together. Uh, it is nice, and it's cozy. Uh, first we pray, and then we munch on our English muffins, our nooks and crannies, and our eggs. Uh, we uh, chat about our week, what's coming up, and it's always a nice, cozy time. It's a nice, cozy time. But when you come to the story that we're about to hear today, well, uh, breakfast in the den is not exactly the cozy affair that I just described. For one thing, we're talking about a lion's den this morning. For another thing, when you, you know when you say, well, we should have Daniel for breakfast uh, some Saturday, uh, you mean by that that Daniel should be on the guest list and not on the menu, amen? This morning, we're talking about Daniel in the lion's den. We're talking about a man under fire for his faith who stands firm uh, even in the face of death. And so I want us to look at this story this morning, a story, an incredible story, a story that I heard as a child and have been fascinated with ever since, a story about God's display of his glory and of his preservation for his people. Number one, I want you to notice with me the first act, if you please, is the prominence that Daniel enjoyed. He had a prominent position. Look in verse 1 of chapter 6, Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. A prominent position. Darius decided to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom. He stationed them throughout the realm and over them three administrators, including Daniel. Last week, we looked at the story of uh, the writing on the wall, and we realized there that the, uh, that the Babylonian Empire was coming to an end. The Medo-Persian Empire was coming to a beginning. And so as the Babylonian Empire fell, the Medo-Persians uh, come into power, and so now King Darius is the Medo-Persian king. It says here he's decided to appoint 120 satraps, and there were three administrators over them all, and those included Daniel. But I notice it was also a very responsible position. The second half of verse 2 says that these satraps would be accountable to them so that the king would not be defra defrauded. So they represented the interests of the king. It was a well-earned position that Daniel is given here because it says in verse 3 that he distinguished himself above the administrators and satraps, above everyone else, because he had an extraordinary spirit. So the king planned to set him over the whole realm. Now that term, an extraordinary spirit, means really uh, uh, not anything mystical. He means by that he had an incredible attitude. He had the ability to oversee people, and he had an attitude about him that was winsome and wonderful. And so the power of attitude prevails. King has plans for Daniel. Daniel is going to be the number two man in the kingdom. Daniel is going to be the king's prime minister, the prominence that he enjoyed. But look at act number two, the plot that he faced. There's an animosity here among Daniel's colleagues. And look in verse 4. The administrators and the satraps, therefore, kept trying to find a charge against Daniel regarding the kingdom. What you have here is the reality of a deep state plot to overthrow the king's prime minister. And so the source of it is uh, that there is a spiritual conflict that was going on then, as there is now uh, in Daniel's day, as it is today. Unbelievers unknowingly being used by satanic forces to attempt to destroy the witness of God's people. And in Daniel, those that they were trying to destroy were godly Jews. The Bible tells us in, Act, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, we as Christians, we don't struggle against flesh and blood. People are not our enemies. We struggle instead against spiritual powers in heavenly places. That's the way the Bible describes it. In other words, there are satanic forces out there that are trying to dis destroy and to discredit the people of God. And so Christians are under fire today, just as Daniel, as one of God's people, was under fire in his day. And so the animosity of his colleagues, they didn't realize it, but they were being used by satanic forces to try to undercut the witness of God's people. Look at the description, though, of Daniel's character in the midst of all this. Look in verse 4. It says, but they could find no charge or corruption. 
because he was trustworthy and no negligence or corruption was found in him. There was no corruption. He was not deceitful. He would not take bribes. There was no negligence in him. Here was a man who attended to the tasks that were given him. It says there was no corruption found. He was unbribable. Then these men said, we'll never find any charge against Daniel unless we find something against him concerning the law of his God. Now, there's an irony in that compliment, that comment. They didn't realize it, but they were paying him a compliment. The only way they said that we're going to be able to trap this man is through his religious convictions. Other than that, this guy is Teflon. Nothing sticks to him. Now, let me just ask you, can people say that about you? Can they talk to you? Can they speak about your excellent attitude, about your faithfulness in work, about your personal purity, about your consistent walk with God? Can they talk about you and say that you understand the limits of human and governmental authority? That you realize that ultimately God and only God is in charge of this universe. Verse 5 tells us that at least part of their animosity was due to their contempt for his religious convictions. That was their mindset. And I hate to say it, but that is the mindset of many today who have hatred for the cause of Jesus Christ. They have a contempt for our religious convictions and for the claims of Christ. Look at the intention of their conspiracy. Because they want to bring Daniel down. Look in verse 6. So the administrators and the satraps went together to the king and they said to him, May King Darius live forever. All the administrators of the kingdom, the prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have agreed. Now what you're about to hear is a lie. This is going to be a lie. This is not truthful. It says, We have all agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an edict that for 30 days, anyone who petitions any god or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den. Therefore, your majesty, establish the edict and sign the document so that as a law of the Medes and Persians, it's irrevocable and it cannot be changed. So King Darius signed the written edict. Now you know, of course, that in fact, Daniel himself, who is the highest among all of these administrators, is the one who would not have agreed with this. They patently lied about him. It had nothing absolutely, by the way, to do with elevating the status of the king. They were appealing to the king's pride and to his ego. It had everything to do with, number one, abolishing the freedom of the people of God, in this case the Jews, and number two, destroying the life and the witness of Daniel. And so we see the agenda of this conspiracy, the intention of the conspiracy. But look at the third act with me. Number three, look at the persecution that Daniel received. A decision is reached by Daniel in verse 10. In verse 10, it tells us that Daniel, when he learned that the document had been signed, he went into his house. Now, what would he do? Daniel, Daniel could have closed the shutters where he usually prayed and faced Jerusalem, and no one would have thought a thing about it. But what does he do? He went into his house. The, window, the windows in its upstairs room opened toward Jerusalem. And three times a day, he got down on his knees, prayed, and gave thanks to his God, just as he had done before. In other words, he continued to pray, thanking God. Now, why did he face Jerusalem? We're in the Old Covenant here, and under the Old Covenant, the presence of God is focused in the city of Jerusalem. And so that's where God's temple was, even though it was destroyed at this time. And so he faces toward Jerusalem. Now, we're under the New Covenant. Which direction do we face as we pray? We face any direction we want to face. We can pray with our arms lifted or with our arms down, our eyes open or closed. We can pray facing north, south, east, or west because the Bible tells us that our own hearts are the temple of God and God dwells within each and every one of us. And so he reaches a decision. I will not yield. I will not compromise my faith in God I will continue to pray and show my allegiance to Yahweh, the God of Israel. But then a discovery is made. Look in verse 11. Then these men went as a group, and they found Daniel petitioning and imploring his God. He didn't try to hide it. They could have seen him outright. They did. They saw him outright uh, uh, as he prayed three times a day. And so next, look in verses 12 and 13. The trap is sprung. So they approached the king. 
And this is not a trap so much against Daniel as it is a trap against the king himself. So they approached the king and they asked about his edict. Didn't you sign an edict that for 30 days any person who petitions any god or any man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den? Didn't you sign that edict? The king answered, as a law of the Medes and Persians, the order stands and it is irrevocable. Then they replied, then they replied to the king, well... Daniel, one of the Judean exiles, has ignored you, the king, and the edict you signed, for he prays three times a day. Now look at verse 14. When you first begin reading verse 14, you're going to think it's saying one thing, but it's not saying that, it's saying the opposite. You're going to think it's saying that the king is outraged at Daniel, but look in verse 14. As soon as the king heard this, he was very displeased. Why? Why? He set his mind on rescuing Daniel and made every effort until sundown to deliver him. And so the king's heart is with Daniel. He knows this man. This man has proven himself to him. He's seen his wisdom. He has seen his ability as an administrator. He knows his loyalty to the king. This man knows that the other administrators of the kingdom have entrapped him. They have ensnared him, the king, and they've ensnared Daniel as well. And so the conspirators have to go to the king to remind him of his duty. Look in verse 15. Now these men went together to the king and they said to him, You know, your majesty, that it's a law of the Medes and Persians that no edict or ordinance of the king establishes can be changed. In other words, you are powerless, O king. The law of the Medes and Persians cannot be changed. And so the den is sealed. In verse 16, the king gave the order. And they brought Daniel and they threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you continually serve, may he rescue you. And a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet ring of his nobles so that nothing in regard to Daniel could be changed. And watch what happens. Now, then the king went to his palace and he spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him and he could not sleep. All this king knew was that Daniel served the true and the living God, and so he knows that Daniel has a God that has the power to save him and to rescue him. Well, finally, look at scene number four. Look at the preservation that he experienced. In verses 19 and 20, Darius comes and Darius brings a fearful question, and he asks a fearful question. Look in verse 19. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and he hurried to the lion's den. When he reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God, the king says. Has your God, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? And then look at Daniel's bold response. Then Daniel spoke with with the king. May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me. For I was found innocent before him, before God. But now I want you to see what Daniel does next. And also before you, your majesty, I have not done harm. Daniel appeals his case, in essence, to the Supreme Court, who is the king himself. Daniel here exercises his civil rights in in appealing to the king and saying to the king, my cause has been misrepresented before you, and I have been, uh, I have been uh, uh, deceitfully uh, condemned. And so he appeals uh, to his civil rights. Look at the enemy's merited execution, verse 23. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to take Daniel out of the den. When Daniel was brought up from the den, he was found to be unharmed, for he trusted in his God. The king then gave the command, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the lion's den, they and their children and their wives. And they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Now the king brings a proclamation, a glorious proclamation. Look in verse 25. Then King Darius wrote to those of every people, nation, and language who live on the whole earth, May your prosperity abound. I issue a decree that in my royal dominion, people must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. Now, as I read this, 
I want you to ask yourself a question. Does this sound like a confession of faith in the Lord God of Israel? Uh, amen. He says he's the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his dominion has no end. He rescues and delivers. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. For he's rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Verse 28, so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And so this glorious story ends, and uh, it's a story I remember hearing in vacation Bible school and in Sunday school as a boy, hearing about how God rescued Daniel from the mouth of the lions. But how does this apply to us today? What is the everyday application? Because I, I, I've, now maybe I just haven't met you, but I don't think there are many of you who have been, ever been thrown into a den of lions. Anybody here thrown into a den of lions? All right, not yet. I just heard not yet, okay? Well, not yet, all right? Well, what is the application? I'd, I'd share with you three applications this morning. Number one, we should not be surprised when persecution comes, even in America. You see, Daniel was a believer in the Lord. And here in a foreign land, he found himself a minority, just as Christians today find themselves a very marked minority in the United States of America. Our days as a majority are gone. We are the minority in our land. And so we should not be surprised when persecution comes, even here in the United States of America. Now, in other countries, of course, we realize that persecution comes. In February of 2015, the Islamic State, or ISIS, posted a video on a Sunday showing the apparent beheading of 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians in Libya. And uh, at first it was thought that this was a hoax, but later on all 21 bodies were found. They had died by being, having their throats slit, and they were then beheaded. They were killed simply for the fact that they were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But now persecution has come to us in America. In February 25, 2013, authorities in New Jersey alleged that a Muslim man beheaded two, again, Coptic Christians, burying their bodies and their heads and their hands in separate graves near Philadelphia, bringing the horror of persecution of Christians in Islamic nations to the United States of America. We see this in the political sphere, that in the political sphere, more and more Christians, evangelical Christians, Roman Catholics, who are strong in their faith and who are outspoken in their faith are being targeted in the political sphere. In considering the confirmation of Brian Busher to a federal judgeship in February of this year, Senator Kamala Harris of California and Senator Maisie Hirono of Hawaii submitted written questions that raised alarms about uh, his membership in a, quote, all-male society comprised primarily of Catholic men. They asked the question, were you aware that the Knights of Columbus opposed a woman's right to choose when you joined the organization? They asked the question, have you ever in any way assisted with or contributed to advocacy against women's reproductive acts? Now, uh, they tried to paint the Knights of Columbus, and I am not a Roman Catholic, that may stun you, but let me defend the Knights of Columbus. They tried to paint the Knights of Columbus in a picture uh, basically accusing, uh, accusing them of horrendous acts. It, it's a bit like accusing your Aunt Harriet's knitting circle of being a Mexican drug cartel. Uh, it, it just, that dog will not hunt, I'm telling you. The Knights of Columbus are a group of respected men who hand out coats to needy children, support cre uh, crisis pregnancy centers, and protest each year in the March for Life in pro-life rallies. So, here is a question that Hirono asked both Busher and Paul Mady, another appeals court nominee. If confirmed, will you recuse yourself from all cases in which the Knights of Columbus have taken a position? In other words, in other words, will you agree not to allow your religious convictions to influence your political decisions in any way? Now, that is tantamount to saying you can be a Christian as long as it doesn't influence how you believe, what you say, and how you vote. That, my friend, is persecution in our midst. On December 18 of 2018, Masterpiece Cake Shop Baker Jack Phillips was back in court, going on the offense again 
after Colorado officials came after him a second time for a matter of conscience. He declined to celebrate an LGBT activist transgender transition from male to female, and because of that was sued and brought into court, even though he had won his previous case in the Supreme Court of the United States of America, targeted for his Christian beliefs. In May of 2015, Gordon College, a, re a highly respected evangelical Protestant school in the Boston area, was nearly stripped of its accreditation, uh, its, its uh, academic accreditation, because of its stand for traditional Christian values, simply for saying that we believe marriage is to be, be between a man and a woman. Now, I have dealt with accreditation issues in the academic realm. Let me tell you, there is tremendous power in the accreditation agencies. And so being stripped of your accreditation is a serious blow to a school. This school was able to maintain their accreditation only through the support of other Christian institutions throughout the land. But we see it also in the sphere of college campuses and college campus life. Michigan's Wayne State University recently de-recognized the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship as a student group. Why? Why are they no longer allowed to meet on campus? It is because the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship um, uh, requires that their officers must be, get this, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the InterVarsity what fellowship? Christian fellowship. And uh, they appealed. They said, you know, fraternities are only allowed to have male leaders. Female athletic clubs only have female leaders. African-American clubs only have African-American leaders. The Secular Student Society Alliance has only secularist leaders. And we're not allowed to have only Christian leaders. But only a Christian organization was targeted. In a December 2nd, uh, 2016 Huffington, Park, Huffington Post article that I read this week, uh, a vicious, vicious article written against Chip and Joanna Gaines. Now, I enjoy Chip and Joanna Gaines. How many of you watch Chip and jo Joanna Gaines? Uh, what's the name of their show? Yeah, Facer Upper, right. No, Fixer Upper, Fixer Upper. And uh, wonderful couple, wonderful Christian couple, positive, wonderful. Uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines go to an anti-gay church. Does it matter was the title. And the answer was affirm, uh, uh, affirmatively, yes, it matters, and we need to go after them with all the power we have in the, uh, the, with the liberal media. Well, when we face persecution, we should not be surprised when persecution comes, even in America. We live in a day in which our Christian values are under assault. Number two, when facing persecution, we must conduct ourselves with courage and grace, with courage and grace. I'll be honest with you, it's, it's, I find it difficult. I, need to, I have to pray and ask God to strengthen me and help me not to become overly irritated as I, as I read stories about Christian persecution in our day. But we must deal with this with courage, but with grace. Polycarp was a bishop, an older man in the year AD 167. He was put to death for his faith in that year. He had tried hard to escape, but he was tracked down and in jail. And uh, when apprehended, he was ordered to renounce Christ and to curse Jesus. He was ordered to, to point to the, uh, the Christians and say, away with the infidels. And so instead, he pointed to all of the Romans and said, away with the infidels, pointing to the unbelievers. Polycarp was ordered to curse Christ. But Polycarp replied, and he said this, Six and eighty years have I served him, and he's done me nothing except good. How then can I curse my Lord and Savior? After that profession of faith, uh, his abductors sentenced him to death by burning at the stake. And so as they prepared the wood and they marched him up onto the pyre, they were about to take his arms and tie his arms behind the post. And he said, No, you don't need to tie my arms around this post. He said, Leave me thus. He who has strengthened me to encounter the flames will give me the power also to stand firm at the stake. And in this manner, he suffered a martyr's death and died in the middle of the flames 
never fleeing from the heat. And so we have to conduct ourselves with courage and with grace. Could I just say finally this? Sometimes God delivers his children from death. But sometimes God delivers his children through death. God delivered Daniel from death. But the fact of the matter is, what happened with Daniel is is not the rule, it is the exception. Because down through the centuries, the blood of the martyrs has been the seeds of the church. It has been the death of believers in Jesus Christ for their faith that has been a bold witness to others who have not yet come to faith in Christ and to Christians who are, who are struggling uh, in their courage. Less than a week before Martin Burnham's abduction by Muslim guerrillas on the Philippine island of Palawan in May of 2001, the New Tribes missionary gave the devotional at a Wednesday evening service at Rose Hill Bible Church in a small town just outside Wichita, Kansas. Some of Martin Burnham's last words there in that Bible study were the last words of Jesus Christ there in the book of John, where Jesus says, follow thou me. In his Bible study there, Burnham talked about Christ's challenge to follow him into whatever future that might involve. It was an appeal to those that were there to consider missionary service. But it was also an appeal, I think, to his own heart, an appeal to courage, an appeal that whatever the future may bring, that he had to be willing to be ready for that and walk into that future bold and confident and strong in his faith. And so Martin Burnham, 42 years old, kept that attitude throughout the 376 days that he and his wife, Gracia, who was 43 years old, were held captive. They were abducted by the Abu Sayyaf terrorist group. And uh, for, for, over, for over a year, held captive in the jungles of the Philippines. Just minutes before a Philippine military raid on the kidnappers that led to Martin's death and Gracia's freedom, the two, hus- husband and wife, the two huddled together in a hammock under a makeshift tent. Martin and Gracia uh, had been thinking out there that there was a chance that they would not get out alive. They were realizing that they might die there in the jungles. And so Martin said to Gracia, Honey, the Bible says to serve the Lord with gladness. And so I want us to go out with singing. Let's go all the way. Let's serve him all the way with gladness. And so that night, the two, laying in their hammock together, they prayed together, holding each other. They recited scripture verses to one another. And then they began to sing. And they sang to each other. And they sang with each other. And then they laid down to rest. They began to sleep. And then the assault began. And the bullets began to fly. And the bullets punctured Gracia's leg, and the bullets punctured Martin's chest. Gracia was able to leave and go back to Wichita, but Martin left and went home to heaven. He died for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what God calls us to. God calls us to live for him, but he also calls us perhaps to die for him. As I studied this passage this week, I was reminded of that, of that scene there in the book of Revelation where the martyrs, those that have died for their faith in the Lord, are standing before the throne, and waving their palm branches, praying, crying out to the Lamb, How long, O oh God, how long before you avenge our blood? God cares for the death of those who die in the name of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite songs growing up was a song entitled, living for Jesus. And uh, I love the song. I love the words to the song. I would sing it for you, but that would be the end of the service. That would be the end of the service right there. But I'd like to to share the words with you. Because what God's telling us here is this. He's telling us, my call on your life is perhaps, Christian, that you be willing to die for me. 
But my call on your life, absolutely, without a doubt, is that you would be willing to live for me. Are you willing to die for Christ? But are you willing to live for him? The words go like this. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free, This is the pathway of blessing for me. O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give my life to thee, for thou in thine atonement didst give thy life for me. I own no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. I'd like to close the service by asking you if you would repeat those words behind me. Because if you will listen very carefully, those words are a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are here and you have never made a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then the re- as the rest of us do, aloud, repeat the words of this song. I want to ask you to join us and profess your new, bold, glorious faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to do just the chorus together. And as I say the words, if you'd repeat them behind me. O Jesus, Lord and Savior, O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thine atonement, for Thou in Thine atonement, didst give Thyself for me, didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master, I own no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. My heart shall be thy throne. My life I give. My life I give. Henceforth to live. Henceforth to live. O Christ for thee alone. O Christ for thee alone. Amen. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you, Lord, for one day today to live for you we are not guaranteed lord even the end of this day but we thank you for each moment that you give us to live for you my life i give henceforth to live O christ for thee alone that is my prayer that is a prayer of each one of us here today O god god it may be that you call one of us here one day to die for you And the choice for us will be either to renounce Jesus Christ or to die for him. May we be bold, Lord, in our resolute faith and our courage to stand strong for Jesus Christ. God, I pray for the young people of this church especially. God, in the days and years and decades ahead, that as the darkness, spiritual darkness may descend over this land, that God, they would stand strong and be a thousand beacons of light the light of the gospel of Jesus in a a dark land, Father, that's greatly in need of the gospel. May they stand strong as beacons of light. And now, God, help us to live this day for you. We do it for the glory and the honor of Jesus, our Lord. In his name we pray, and all that God's people said, amen. Let's stand.